Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The sharper-eyed amongst you will have noticed that I'm not Kate Moss, <laughs> but I do have the excuse of being Greg Moss. Kate is in London all of this week for the Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction and is on stage as we speak at Royal Festival Hall and will be again tomorrow night. And she is, therefore, simultaneously having a week of great excitement with the shortlisted authors for that prize and great disappointment because she doesn't get to talk to Adrian Noble about the magnificent production of Ross that he has blessed our theatre with. I saw it on Saturday night, and half the audience stood up at the end to give it an ovation. And last night, Monday night, the other half stood up. <laughs> it is a truly magnificent show. Can we start with um, why Ross? For you, what was it that drew you to the show? I was asked to do it. <laughs> Um, I, I, I had actually read it a, a, quite a long time ago when I was running the RSC, but it didn't seem the right thing at, the, at that time. And then I was rung out of the blue to say, would I like to do this play? Can you say what makes the show not the right thing to do? Um, well, th th there was a particular context then. The, the, question, the question then is, was it the right thing for a classical theatre company to do that was mainly doing Shakespeare, and this wasn't great because there were no women in it? So it wasn't a great thing to do. <laughs> I've actually got on my list for later on, but I'll bring it forward. Is it different having a company which is solely men? Although there are many women on the creative team. There are, there are indeed, and, and indeed on the, on the support staff and the stage management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it, it, indeed it is. It, it, it is. Um, we're blessed by a, a, a group of 18 of the loveliest blokes you'll ever meet. They're just <laughs> gorgeous. So... It, so there wasn't a sort of a, a problem of kind of chaps and all that sort of stuff, macho stuff, testosterone, no, 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 no problem with that. But, but I suppose yes is the answer. It is a bit different. I remember interviewing a few years ago uh, Chachi de la Martinez, who's a, com a conductor, who maintains that female orchestras are completely different from male orchestras. Yes. I've never, I've never directed a, 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 an all-women production, I have to say. Um, and, of course, if you're doing Shakespeare, they, they are... They tend to, well, in the olden days, they tend to be biased towards men. Nowadays, it's, it's all, their own all-female all productions are yes. sort of de rigueur, aren't they? Yes. Well, tell me, just following on from this, why Ross was the question. Yes. Why now for Ross, do you well, think? Well, the, the, the little ad addendum to why Ross is, is of course, Joseph Fiennes, who, who is perfect for this and is sensational yes. in the part, absolutely sensational. Um, I've known him for sort of 20 odd years and I produced him in a play, I didn't direct it, um, back, back at the, 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 the pit in London, Son of Man, in which he was magnificent. So, so that was all part of the answer of why, of why Ross. There, there are certain plays that you can't do unless you've got the people to do them. You know, you don't do King Lear unless you've got King Lear. And you'd be nuts to, anyway. Um, and this is a, 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 sim a, similar, a, sim a similar situation. Are there any other parts within it which are equally essential to the casting as Joseph finds as Ross? The, the, well, the, the, there, there are crucial parts, but, 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 you, but, but I was content to embark on the voyage with just mm. Joseph. Um, and, then, and then we got you know, Peter Policarpio and Paul Freeman and Mickey Feast and people like that who came, who came and joined the, 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 the journey. But, but it's uh, um, the, the great emotional and spiritual journey of the play is, of course, undertaken by, 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 by Joe. Yes. And you've got to have someone who's got the, the chops and also the, the hunger yes. to go on that journey, really. When I saw it Saturday night with this standing ovation, he and the whole company looked so gratified, but also almost surprised. <laughs> <laughs> if, well, that, I, th I, th I think artists are naturally modest, actually. I mean, mostly they are, and they were, they were delighted that people were enjoying it so much, because it's quite... It is quite rigorous. To answer your second question, why now? It's, a, it's, a, it's very interesting, because it's, it, it's the first time in the, in the brief, albeit brief, um, performance history of the play, in which we have, I hope, explored the, um, the, the, the background issues of the play, both from a, a Western point of view and also from an, 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 an Arabic point of view. Um, up until now, 
all of the Arabic parts were played by white people who put brown put boot polish on their faces, which is nowadays you think well, that's absolutely extraordinary. And the the um, the the play has a, um, a a wonderful ability to offer up opportunities in which one can explore the very complicated and quite often poignant situations that occur in the Middle East. Um, and it's shocking, really, that um, many of the problems, horrors that we listen to on the Today programme every morning or read in our newspapers every day emanate from this period um, and the dreadful decisions that were made in this period. Um, and so I find myself... I listen to the news completely differently now. They talked, for example, the other day about Tafas. Um, on, on, I think it was on the Today programme. Something happened which is in southern Syria. And, of course, Tafas is talked about in the play, and it's the village in which 19 women were, quotes, obscenely bayoneted, two of whom were pregnant. Um, and so you think, God, we're still doing it. It is terrible. It is absolutely terrible. But do you think that the play makes a judgment? It's, it, it, it's not a play written yesterday. It's not a play written in the context of today's politics. But do you think it makes a judgment from its time that still resonates today? It, it certainly has. It's a great play, I think. And, and therefore, it, it, I, I think it judges certain things. It, 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 I think it judges the... The um, implicitly, it judges the folly of power. Um, it judges the Sykes-Picot agreement, which was the agreement made at the beginning of the First War when two relatively minor bureaucrats, one French and one English, got a large map and a pencil and divided up the Middle East. And that's what they did. And the lines you will see on the news tonight of Syria, etc., and Iraq, are the lines made by these two rather minor bureaucrats. And, that, at the end and, of and so the play does indeed implicitly judge them. As, as that's not a very good way of, of de dealing, dealing with a... With, with a well, this, this brings us to quite an, a question that's often um, asked about Rattigan, which is how modern is he? There is, so you, you, you're arguing that he's strongly modern in that his politics or the political questions that he raises still resonate. Yes. And then this comes from the second half of his career. Yeah, but he's a, th th the thing about, about Radigan, it seems to me, is that... Is that oh, no, that's a ridiculous generalisation. <laughs> you haven't said it yet. I haven't said it. No, it is in my head. It's ridiculous. <laughs> okay. no, this play, I mean, in, to, in many, many respects, Radigan is a classicist. Um, and our exploration of the play has led us to really appreciate the... The, the structure, the form of the play is the, the most extraordinary f um, piece of writing, of, of structure. He was a great, you know, he, Lawrence was a great Greek scholar. And in many ways, I was saying to Joseph this afternoon, in many ways he, he, um, he embodies, Lawrence embodies the Renaissance ideal of the Greek mind in the Roman body. Um, and we found that the play, um, the more we have identified, if you like, the, 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 the classical skeleton in, upon which the flesh, and bur the flesh of the play is, hangs, the more we've identified that, the richer our work has become and our production has become. So if you look here, for example, um, we've been able to exploit the um, marvellous space that's been created since the building was rebuilt and renovated so we can have a, a space we, we can perform but we have what I would call an imaginative space a space a huge space uh, uh, that, that, that is filled if you like by the imagination of the playwright um, and so we've been, we've, we've been able to make the play on the one hand epic but, but at the same time intimate and domestic when it needs to be. And, 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 and so this, this new stage has served it frightfully well. I think it's always very exciting when the depth of the stage is greater than the width of the stage. It seems to me to give a, a director more scope. 
It does, and, and well, it, it, gives you, it, it gives you a sense of the past, doesn't it? The, the past is behind us, isn't it? And the future's in front of us. <laughs> but, mo- but you create in the show that... I, I, actually, could you raise your hands if you've seen the show already? That would be an interesting thing to know. So quite a few people already. There, you, cre- you create at the upstage tableaus that comment upon the action that takes place closer to the audience. That's correct. And that's a wonderful dialogue. It, it, it is, and, 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 the, and the, we, we discovered quite late on in rehearsals, actually, that, that um, we found inside the text, inside the, sh- inside the telling of the story, that, 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 that uh, it's, like a, it's like a Greek chorus developed, whereby... The, the, the interesting about Greek choruses, I think, is that if they're, when they're wearing masks, is that they can't close their eyes. Mm. Therefore, they have to w- look at all this horror. And the story of the play, for those of you who haven't, I won't tell you the story, but the shape of the play is that, of course, in the, in the first half, it's full of opportunity and the excitement of battle and valour and honour. And, you know, and then the second half, slowly and inexorably takes us to the bloodbath of those people in the village of Tafas and the 4,000 Turkish soldiers who were butchered, um, systematically butchered, um, as part of the, that particular campaign. So, so the second half takes us inexorably towards this. And, 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 and we had... The, just there, where, by that pillar there, which, by the way, supports the entire building. I'm talking. I said, well, <laughs> can you take that pillar away? I said, no, no. Unfortunately, not. It supports everything. Is 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 we had a, a kind of almost a like, let's say, like a Greek chorus of of guys who couldn't close their eyes, who had to see all of these terrible, terrible things, like Lawrence saw all these terrible, terrible things. It works wonderfully well, all of that. I want to mention in passing that the programme for this show is particularly good. It has two excellent essays, one by William Boyd and one by Dan Rebellato, on, um, respectively, T.E. Lawrence and uh, Terence Rattigan. Um, Could I just ask you about the... a question about the the themes because those essays touch upon those themes. And, make, and Dan Rebellato makes the point that there are parallels between Rattigan's life and Lawrence's life. And two things that I'd like you to consider are celebrity and being uncomfortable with it and repressed emotion, mm. which are strong elements of this play and of Rattigan's life. The, the, that's, the, that's, that's, that's so interesting. Those, those questions are so interesting because, because um, one can see the... The 1950s, in a way, coming through this play, uh, uh, but particularly, obviously, um, ra- 1950s from Rattigan's point of view, a relatively short time after the, fir- after the Second World War, um, a short time after the end of... Um, What's it called when everyone's called up? What's it called? Conscription. Conscription, yeah. Or, or even still, still conscription in, in parts, of, parts of the 1950s, rationing and all of that. But more, and more particularly from Rattigan's point of view, um, the fact that he and a close group of people had to effectively live a lie because they were gay um, <clears throat> at a time when it was illegal to, to... Not illegal to be gay, but illegal to act upon being gay. And so... Um, he obviously saw in Lawrence a kind of a, a, a parallel figure, both, both of homosexuality, but also of a, a general thing of repression. But, there's a, there's a, but what he does, which is extraordinary, is he, 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 he delves deep, deep into the, into, the, um, into the subject matter because um, Lawrence as a Greek scholar, and Lawrence seeks self-knowledge, like a good Greek scholar, seeks self-knowledge. But the, the terrible irony is that Lawrence, what Lawrence is, um, was physically abused, and so that, if you like, pollutes his sense of himself, and so he can't deal with himself, and so he needs to become somebody else. But could I take the second part, the repressed emotion, uh, a, a step further? Drama, we're always told, 
is conflicts of strong personalities with competing objectives. So why is it that this repressed emotion makes such a good subject for drama? Well, it isn't just in this play. It's, it's, you, can, you, can say, you can say in, in many, many, many plays. I mean, Hamlet <laughs> for, for, for springs to mind. But, but it, it <clears throat> the, the, the story of Lawrence is fascinating because there's the, there's, there's the obvious sort of um, repression and the, the um, um, dealing with a, the, 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 like the rubbing together of the public and the private man, which always makes marvellous drama. So, so the conflicts are sometimes with external agencies, so with, with um, the British Army, for example. Um, when with... he wishes he no longer needed to act, it's his duty that forces him to act. It's his will that makes him, that makes him act. But, 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 that, but, but the, the real... The real so I'll put it this way. Running through the whole play, there's an adventure story. You know, Lawrence in Arabia. It's a big, it's a big adventure story about what happened. And there's a, there's a parallel um, um, emotional story of what it, how marvellous it was and then how shocking it and appalling it became. So there's those two are overriding arcs. But, but, but as they, at the same time, there's this fascinating um, juxtaposition of the, of the private man and the public man, which, of course... Which of course he takes from Rattigan takes from classical sources. Shakespeare made a living out of that. You know that Henry V is is based entirely upon the juxtaposition of the the the, the, the private man expressed through his soliloquies and his fears of being a king and being a soldier, and the public man who is required to do things um, that are very difficult and in and in the public glare. And I think those things, Rattigan and and certainly Lawrence understood. Um, profoundly, yes. Can I, if I quote one of the members of the British forces who says, I don't care what's right. It's, the subtext is that it's, it must be made to work. Yeah. It's not whether or not it's right. This is our objective. We must achieve that. It, that well, that's war, isn't it? That's, that's, that's um, what has to happen in war, um, particularly that war. So... Um, the next lines are quite, or the lines just before that are quite interesting because he talks about Lawrence, the, 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 Lawrence just is going to go back and fight and he talks about, you must understand what kind of a deserter you're sending back and what kind of a war you're sending him back to. And it's, and it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation devoid of heroism or glory or honour. Um, he, he's a, in that moment. He's a wonderfully conflicted character who sees himself as a deserter as he goes back. Yeah. Which is a one. Could I ask you a couple of questions about um, aspects of the technical aspects of the production and how you developed it? For example, there are the uh, scenes which are the English-speaking characters. There are the scenes among the Turks and the scenes among the Arab-speaking characters, including Lawrence. How did you manage that in rehearsal? Well, I'll, I'll actually go back a little stage before, in fact, which is that we changed design about halfway through because we were sort of doing a series of, I suppose, relatively naturalistic sets. Um, like, for example, the early scenes were set in Nissan huts that did rather clever things. And then as we worked on it, we realised that, in fact, it was more... We needed a landscape rather than... A, that, that it wasn't real... It was a dream, actually. And so we went for something that had a big... I, I asked Bill, the, the, the designer, I said, I want you to, to put Circus Maximus on the... On the to just to say, you know, we've done that, you can't really see, but it goes back to a semicircle at the back there. And then he came up with these marvellous seven pillars. And we decided that we would do even the English scenes that are set in dreary old Uxbridge in December um, on this... Surface, which just kind of worked marvelous, as you would with a Shakespeare play. You know, you don't. I'm tempted to ask our very erudite audience why there are seven pillars, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, another thing, when you have transitions between, so everybody speaks English all of the time, 
But when you have transitions between what is English and then ostensibly Arabic conversation, how do you manage those moments of transition? Well, we, 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 we don't think about them a lot. <laughs> that's okay. The, that's the honest truth. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Arabs do use an accent. Um, and but Joseph doesn't. But Joseph he's... doesn't, unless, but he does in one point, one area oh. of the play, he does. When he's talking to the Turkish officer, he uses a slight accent when he's, when he's pretending to be he um, an Arab. That's the only time yes. he, he, he does. But it, it seemed to me that it wouldn't contribute much to the, to the, to the story or to people's enjoyment of the story. I think it, it just kind of work, works as it is. We do, the only thing we do, however, is we have one or two phrases in, in Arabic. Um, that, but that's really all we do. And also in Arabic, you have some magnificent music uh, vo with uh, vocal music that accompanies transitions between yes. scenes and also sometimes underscores the yes. action. Yes. How, did, how do you work well, that out? Well, there's, so, 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 some of them are mentioned in the script, like, like, like the, 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 uh, 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 the, uh, the, the... There's a song that ce celebrates this great warrior that is mentioned in the script. But we found in the We, I say we. My composer, Mia Satorio, found this extraordinary resource. I was, and I'd be, I put my hand up. I was completely ignorant of it, totally ignorant of it. A resource of Arabic music, Arabic dance, Arabic song. I knew nothing about it at all. And it's, it's fantastic. Just an extraordinary cornucopia of art. Um, I, 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 and we, we, we use... Um, Mia has taken that music and used it sometimes literally, just li literally note for note, and sometimes she's done, often she's done her own thing with it. And we use film of reasonably authentic film of, of, of the period, um, all of which contributes to the sort of, sort of mixed up thing of the dream. But, but it, it was such a wonderful cultural resource. And, and again, did you know, fascinating did for Did you audience. know that Mia Satoria would deliver that? Sort of soundtrack. I, I, I thought she would, actually. I've worked with her before, and, yeah. she's, and she's, she's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but can we, just specifically, when you, when you bring in incidental music, which at first, uh, in the audience, you don't notice, it's unobtrusive, but it comes to colour the scene as the scene evolves. Um, how do you do that in rehearsal? How do you, when you've got an empty auditorium, and it's just you and your team, the actors on stage, they're perhaps wearing their own clothes. Yeah, yeah. How do you get the sense of the atmosphere that will provide? Well, well, well the music is introduced slowly during, during rehearsals, these days anyway, because, because you know, kit is much more sophisticated now. You can bring in stuff and play it. And, but the, the, the really interesting thing is how is, is the, way, the way that the, um, the music... Um, fed in to the show. I'll give you an example. Actually, in the, literally in the last week, um, I, I had um, a thought about... There's a, there's a scene in which the Turkish officer, who is really Lawrence's nemesis, Mickey Feast's character, who has never met Lawrence, but from what he's learned, he, like Montgomery and Rommel, he kind of singles him out as, 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 the, as the principal opponent and he identifies Lawrence's weakness. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a scene in which he describes and thinks through how he is going to break, break Lawrence's will. And finally, that's done through rape, in fact. But how he's going to do it and there's, there's, there's the extraordinary thing that I only just noticed, actually when my wife pointed it out to me, in fact, is that at the beginning of that section, he drinks wine. He says, I'd like a red burgundy. And so we got a nice latache. We got a nice... And the section starts with him drinking wine and saying, I pity Christians, but of course, under, in Christianity, this isn't a sin. And the net... And, and the drinking of the wine, and, and I identified it as uh, like, drink, like drinking a potion, mm. and that he would create this energy, this spell that would destroy Lawrence. And then, so 
And it all came from realising that having... You know, why, why, would, why would Rattigan have him saying, give me, give me a glass of wine, give me some red burgundy? Why? Why, why do that? And so, so, so we followed it through. And so we, we have this scene whereby he drinks. And then I underscored that with a little very, very, very light music. So it became like a spell. And so it was a marvellous conversation, if you like, between Rattigan, um, the music, <laughs> Mia, and myself, is sort of to, to, to build what I think is a marvellous moment. And it's very hard to... It's a very hard scene to, to, to communicate because he was writing in 1959 and if he had talked about homosexuality, he would be closed down. The play would never, ever have been put on. So he has to talk in code. He presents the Turks as decadent. Yeah, he does. That Turk, he does. No, he absolutely does, yeah. No, he, uh, does. he and his captain. And he contrasts that, I think, with the um, austerity and in some cases the purity of purpose of the Arab nation builders. Do you think that's fair? That's dead accurate. I mean, whether it's the degree to which it's historically true, I don't know. But that's where his sympathy lies. That is absolute, absolutely where his sympathy lies. I mean, the, 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 um, the hatred of the Arabs to the Turks is... That's, that's historically correct. I mean, that's not, that's not radical making that up at all. That's absolutely correct. And... Lawrence's mistrust of the Turks, particularly his own treatment, highlighted by his own treatment under, when he was capt captured by the Turks, um, highlights all that. But, but yet, certainly Rattigan has, a, has sympathies. He has view, view, political sure. views. Before we take some questions from the audience, I have just one more. Your, your cast doubles brilliantly, mm. seamlessly, brilliantly, and you really have to think about it in order to see who's being who. Mm. Um, do, do you know when you're choosing somebody who's perhaps got, for a role in the first act, what they'll do in the second act? I, actually, I didn't. I'll be honest with you. I didn't in this, on this case. I, I, we, we chose fabulous actors. Mm. And when, when you've got really good actors, then you double. I mean, in a way, I was quite confident about that because... because um, you, simply because my, if, you, if your background is in Shakespeare, you, you, you're used to doubling. And, and the key, key always to doing Shakespeare is you cast the best actor. And if you get a good actor, they can almost invariably play their actors. Fantastic. <laughs> it's only in movies that they say, oh, you're, you're five foot six, and therefore you can only be cast as that. So if, if we could have House Lights Up, we will take some uh, questions from the audience for Adrian Noble, the director of Ross, please. I'll take the first question from Susie in the front row here. Yeah, I have a, it's another technical question. Where Mia brought a sort of different atmosphere to you regarding the music, what stage do you work with your sonographer? Or was it just set design? No, 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 first. It's the first person I work with. And because this is such a particular space, so yeah. what? Susie has a carrying voice, so I'm sure you've all heard. But just to make sure, what did working in this space bring to Adrian's conception of Ross? Well, the, the, uh, the, the crucial, the kind of break, there were two breakthroughs, really. One was realising that under the rebuild, there was a kind of a, 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 a large field at the back of the stage here, which I was passionate to use. And secondly, as I said, halfway through, we went down the wrong way. And we came back and we realised that, in fact, we were dealing with a, an, a, an epic in the old-fashioned set, a piece of epic theatre, rather than a, a kind of a, a, a little piece. It was a, it's a big beast and it needs big, big performers and a, and a big, generous space, which we've got here. And then, then we added several things in. So, so we're sitting here... Upon a trap. We're so, on a hatch. We could disappear at any moment. We could. <laughs> which, this goes up and down, which I found this existed. So I liked that. So I wanted to use that. Then, then, I, then, I, then I asked for some stairs, which they have there. And Bill came up with the idea of two doors. And so we, we, we made a kit um, with which to tell our story. Well, good. Um, yes. Uh, slightly following on from that. Good. 
space and know how to fill it and capture it. Because it's not necessarily the easiest theatre in the world. Thank you. So thank you very much. How important was it that the cast were capable of exploiting this extraordinary space? Well, it, it, it's helpful. I mean, it, it wasn't central, to be honest, because... But in are... the programme, you'll notice that most people have got previously at CFT. They have. It, 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 the great thing about English actors is that they are astonishingly flexible. I mean, really astonishingly so. That, as opposed to... As opposed to, for example... Well, when I was a little boy... He won't be drawn... I won't be drawn. No, I will. I'll tell you. When I, when I was a lad, uh, about, well, about about twenty something, I worked in fr in Paris. I did a production in Paris of 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 a, of a play that I'd done in London with Helen Mirren, which was very successful, and um, it was set up by Peter Brook, who's a very famous director. Right? And Peter said to me, "It's vital you ask for." He said two things you must ask for. One is a long rehearsal period, and the second thing is a lot of money. Right? <laughs> So I, and I didn't, anyway, I didn't have time for a long rehearsal period, but I realised why. It's because, it's because slowly during rehearsals, instead of the company coming together, the company started to, 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 to splinter. Oh. And people with that kind of background started going in that direction and that kind of background, a more naturalistic, more classical, more film. And they started going in different directions. And I couldn't hold them together. And what he meant was, to, you've got to make one company. With British actors, the great thing is, they, within two days of working together, and a lot of them had never met each other even, it's like we've been working together for ten years. And does your star lead that? Yeah, 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 absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have another question? Yes, please. Thank you very much. The question is on the uh, politics and the contemporary situation related to performing in this play. Has that had an emotional impact on the cast? I, I think, I think without, without question, I think we all, we all hear and we all look at the world a little differently now, um, partly because we, well, actually we have more knowledge. We, you know, the, we, it was the shocking that we were sort of ignorant, you know, well, I talk about myself, you know, but, but just in terms of what, what, what was happening there and what is happening now. But that you, that you see the way pain and horrors are kind of passed down from generation to generation. It's just very, very upsetting, actually. And I think, I, I imagine, I've not asked them, but I imagine the same would apply to all, all of the cast. Did you ask them to do research that might have led them into... We did a lot of research, and, and, I, I, and, and we, we, we've all done research in different ways. And, and, and with a play like this, you have to. I mean, just... We use, actually... The, the, we use film, but we also use maps quite a lot. And... Um, the, 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 the resonance, the resonance that come out of those maps. One clever thing, very clever thing that your design does is that the different groups have a different, each have a different map. Yes, they have. They their, see yeah. their world. They see the Near East in a different way. But, the, but there's a, one of the great penultimate scene there takes place in Gaza. Mm. Think, oh. Yeah. Another question? Yes. So did Adrian Noble's company producing the play today have opportunities that the original production of Ross wouldn't have had? Well, I think without question, actually. Firstly, that I, I, I think contemporary theatre artists tend to approach their work a bit different, more differently to, 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 to the way it would have been done in 1959, by which I don't mean just... Um, blacking up, you know, and you'll see in, Lawrence, in the film Lawrence of Arabia, you'll see Alec, Maca Alec Guinness sort of with, with, with boot polish on, you know, and you think, it's not, it's, it's impossible nowadays, yeah. absolutely impossible, it would be embargoed, that. Um, but but um, 
I, and I think what, what, what the opportunity that, that, that we've been given here in Chichester is to, is to, to, is to rediscover a play. And, and you, can re- you rediscover it if you ask questions of all characters. So if you ask about the Arabic characters, you find, you find a whole world that we, we knew nothing about. And it's all accurate. Rattigan's given us it all. If you, if you find, for, for us, you, you see, when it, was, when it first opened, um, the sitcoms were the army, you'll probably remember this, some of you, the army game, right? Bootsy and Snudge. All of these, they, so, so when the curtain went up, they would know immediately where they were. They would laugh, and they, would know, they would know those, that sergeant major backwards. Um, but of course, it's different now. We can now look at that world slightly more critically and with, 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 with the benefits of hindsight. And so we can explore in a sl- probably a more rigorous way, perhaps. Not, not a better way, just a different way now, nowadays. In, so one get, gets more perspectives on the Lawrence story than perhaps was there originally. I don't know. That's a great place to finish because this is a show which gives us many different perspectives on, on Ross, on T.E. Lawrence, the man who discovered in halfway through his life that he was, in fact, T.E. Chambers. And this question of identity, it, it runs right the way through it. And this production manages to show how all different sides in this extraordinarily complex, intimate and geopolitical story, they all think they're the hero. They all think they're competing for that centre ground. Before we um, thank Adrian Noble and give the theatre back to his crew and company, could I just say that on the 16th of June at 10.30am, there's a technical and creative team working for 90 minutes, giving you their insight, putting together this production of Ross. On the 18th of June at 11am, a masterclass with assistant director Alice Malin about the play. That's a ticketed event at £5 each. Finally, on the 21st of June, the post-show discussion with members of the cast, led, as usual, by Kate Moss. You know who I mean. Tickets are free, so just stay behind in your seats at the end of the performance or come, from, uh, come to this instead of watching Newsnight at home. In the meantime, Kate will also be back for the pre-show for Mark Hayhurst's new show, First Light, on Wednesday, 15th of June. And uh, it says here, she's also told me that I must mention my latest play, which is written for the older CFYT members in the Festival of Chichester on in uh, St. John's Chapel. Kate says, if I don't read this out, you in the audience will let me know. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, above all, for Adrian, to Adrian Noble for a magnificent production, which if you've not enjoyed it, you have a treat in store. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.